Hello and welcome back to Rock Records Reviewed. My name's Adam and this week we're going to take a look at the top 10 albums by folk rock pop goddess Joni Mitchell. Uh, Joni Mitchell was born uh, Roberta Joan Anderson in Toronto in, uh, no, in Alberta, Canada in 1943. And she spent her formative years busking around the streets of Toronto uh, and uh, the nightclubs of Western Canada before moving to LA in 1965, where she soon fell in with the Laurel Canyon crowd and the rest is kind of a, a folk jazz tinged pop music history. I think Joni Mitchell is absolutely one of the greats. I really do. Um, uh, you know, I hasten to use the word genius, but if you are going to use it in a, uh, a musical, pop musical um, context, then I think she's up there and poss very possibly one of them. And I'm, hopefully maybe I'm going to justify that statement as we go along. Um, she's famous for her many, many guitar tunings, um, uh, multi-instrumentalist, uh, ethereal melodies, her clever words, and she's very, very serious approach to her craft. Um, she's a real artist in every sense of the word. In fact, she is a real artist. She's a very fine painter. And uh, in fact, she calls herself a painter derailed by circumstance. And I think the more you explore her back catalogue, the more that kind of makes sense. Um, I have a very personal uh, investment in Joni Mitchell as my mum was a professional folk singer and she used to sing many Joni Mitchell songs as part of her set. Uh, so I, I was exposed to Joni's uh, music from a very, very early age. In fact, my mum sang them on that very guitar just there. Um, but look, let's get into it. And at number 10 from 1977, her ninth album, Don Juan's Reckless Daughter. Now, let me say off the bat um, that uh, this double album is not my favourite Joni Mitchell album, but I do think it deserves to be in the top 10. Um, just for the sheer scope uh, of her ambition and her creativity. This is an experimental album. It's jazzy. There's fusion on here. It was the last album she made for Asylum before moving to her new label. So I think she felt a lot freer that she was able to sort of really experiment with stuff. Um, so, for example, the first uh, song on here has got six guitars with six different tunings on it. Um, there's along the way you'll get improvisation, spoken word, uh, lots of very percussive, heavy stuff. The bloody single mindedness of it is impressive alone. Um, the, musically, it's kind of dominated by the fretless bass of Jaco Pistorius, the legendary jazz bass player that she fell in with. Um, and, and that bass is everywhere. But along the way, we also have Larry Carlton and Chaka Khan. And um, this is not perhaps the first Joni Mitchell album you'd go to. I think it's an album you'd get into once you are fully signed up to the Joni Mitchell fan club. Um, at number nine from 1968, her first album, Song to a Seagull. Um, Joni uh, had got to uh, Laurel Canyon. and David Crosby sort of uh, says that it was like she crash landed from another planet. Um, and, and the buzz was there instantly. She was playing her songs, or, you know, in, in living rooms around Laurel Canyon. And, and she even managed to uh, get a couple of people to cover her songs, which we'll talk about later. But everyone was just mesmerized. Um, there's a there's a shot of Eric Clapton in the uh, Laurel Canyon uh, two parter uh, that's coming out soon where he's just sitting at her feet in someone's living room, just absolutely transfixed at what she's playing. It's lovely. Um, but Crosby uh, offered to produce her first album for her. And now he wasn't a seasoned producer and by his own admission, uh, he gave the album a bit of an underwhelming vibe. He, he, he to this day thinks it was still a bit flat and the feel wasn't quite there. And there were all sorts of issues in post-production. I sort of hear what he's saying, but that voice, that beautiful, pure, uh, you know, crystal alto singing voice, it's just, uh, and those guitar tunings, you know, from the opening m moments of the, uh, the, the first track, um, I Had a King, you're kind of drawn in and you're not quite sure where the song is going until you hit that very, very simple, effective chorus. And so many of the guitar vibes uh, and intros on this record, they became an, an absolute blueprint for folk singers, for generations to follow. It was, it was just hugely influential. Um, 
and and she dedicates this album to her grade seven English teacher for teaching her to love words. So you have you had a very, very good idea um, straight off the bat that this was a very earnest, serious artist. Um, at number eight from 1972, her fifth album for the Roses. Um, this is best known for the sort of hit single. You turn me on. I'm a radio. Uh, which got to number 25 on the Billboard charts, which was her first top 40 hit. This was her fifth album. Um, the record company, as we've heard so many times on this show, the record company saying, we don't hear a hit, Joni, write us something. And so she sarcastically thinking, well, what am I, some kind of hit factory? She sarcastically wrote this song and lo and behold, it got into the charts. Um, these songs are kind of mostly inspired by her relationship with James Taylor. Um, when they started out, she was the star and, and he was the, the, the wannabe folk singer. And uh, that was changing. He was becoming more and more successful. He was also struggling with a few addictions and things. And the relationship, the imbalance in that relationship, uh, or the change rather, the shift in that relationship started becoming a bit of a problem. Um, so the songs themselves, though, they're, they're elegant and lyrical and the rhythms are light and folky. The lyrical punches themselves, they're, they're, they're emotional and they're ironic. Um, but there is a subtle jazz cloud looming on the horizon, um, which I think just adds to the sophistication of it all. Um, and number seven from 1991, uh, her 14th album, Night Ride Home. Now, this is by some distance the latest Jodie Mitchell album on my list. Her 80s albums hadn't been well received. Many people thought they were far too synthy. She was using drum machines too much. So it was quite a relief when she returned to this comparatively sort of simple album, which starts with crickets chirping in the night. And then the album sort of loosely follows a sort of subdued nocturnal jazz vibe that more or less set the template for uh, all her albums to follow from here on in. Um, Joni was a very, very heavy smoker and uh, her voice by this stage is is, is richer. Um, it's deeper, certainly. Um, musically, there's lots of shades of Hegira on this record, a record we'll talk about in a while. Um, and, and there are no huge standouts as songs, but it really was good to hear a familiar Joni uh, sonically. And, and it was a sound that just sat so much better on the ears than much of the stuff we'd heard uh, just leading up to this one. Uh, at number six from 1975, her seventh album, Hissing of the Summer Lawns. Um, by now, the signs that Joni was moving away from rock and folk into jazz uh, were, were, were really quite clear. This is, much, again, experimental. It's jazzier than a lot of the stuff that had come before. It's almost an avant-garde record. You listen to um, uh, The Jungle Line and there's, there's uh, these sort of sampled, it's said to be one of the first ever samples on record, of these uh, tribal drums um, on a loop. Um, it, it wasn't a popular record when it came out. It was, um, it was the, panned by the, the, the critics. Um, they, they wanted to know where the tunes had gone. Um, and I think it certainly does mark the point in Joni's career where the tunes are harder to pick out. Um, but they're, they're no less arresting for it, the songs. You know, once they get their hooks in you, they're almost sort of deeper uh, in you. Um, in France, they kiss on Main Street. Um, the tie and the title track itself is kind of jazz, folk, pop personified. Um, in the end, the the opinion on this album changed quite quickly, uh, and it was it won a Grammy for um, best female vocal pop performance, um, whatever that is, uh, because it's certainly not a, a pop record. Um, now, it's often with these lists, when we get to the top four or five, these are the real kind of records that if you're if you're unfamiliar with the artist, they're probably the ones you should go to to, to check out, you know, what what made their their greatness. And, and there's no no uh, change here with these top five. And at number five, I'm going to put a record that I think a lot of you are surprised it's this low. Uh, but let me stress, I love Joni Mitchell. Um, and um, I love this record, so don't don't be too hard on me. Um, I just I just find it very hard to to separate all these 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 amazing records. Uh, number five, from 1974, uh, her sixth album, Caught and Spark. Now this was her most commercially successful album. It was uh, 
walked to number two in the USA. Uh, it went double platinum. It was best album of the year by Village Voice, number 111 in Rolling Stone's top 500 albums of all time. Um, so why? Um, well, I think one of the reasons it's got three of her most accessible singles on it, Help Me, Free Man in Paris and Raised on Robbery. She'd had a year off to reassess her direction. She, she'd hinted with that sort of jazzy cloud looming on the horizon I've mentioned uh, on, on For the Roses. And I think she was deciding that that really was where she was going to go. Um, so this is where she reassessed her direction. So the, there is more than a slight jazz inflection in, in, in the seemingly kind of random chord patterns. But the hooks are still there. That's crucial. Um, you know, when I listen to this album, it sort of it just it sounds like a girl's summer dress just kind of blowing freely in the breeze, you know, catching the light occasionally. And it just doesn't care if, if it has your attention or not. It's just so confident uh, in what it is. It's extraordinarily confident and she's such a single minded artist. And I think this album is absolutely one of the best representations of that, which is one of the reasons why I think it's so popular. Um, at number four from 1970, uh, her third album, Ladies of the Canyon. So this is her Laurel Canyon album. Now, the Laurel Canyon scene, as I'm sure many of you know, you know, it was with Crosby, Stills and Nash, it was Neil Young, James Taylor. Um, the Birds, The Doors, Joni Mitchell, Jackson Brown, The Eagles. Just an incredible time in music and, and one of my favourite musical scenes of all. And three of the songs on here are, are, are part of the, the soundtrack of Laurel Canyon. You've got Big Yellow Taxi, Woodstock and The Circle Game. And this album, I think, is often seen as the bridge between the young folk singer and the more sophisticated tunesmith and, and wordsmith that she morphed into. Uh, it's impossible not to think of Joni Mitchell sitting around in a living room with some guitars with Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, strumming away, you know, their new songs that they've just written to each other, uh, probably sharing an enormous joint at the same time. And who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Um, you know, I, I've got a, a theory that when you really love an artist and you're really invested in an artist and you're listening to the music, you're hearing more than the music. You're, 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 you're picturing the backstory, you're thinking of the backstory, of the anecdotes, of all the things that you've read about and watched. And it all comes together to create this, you know, not just the music, that's the front of it. But behind it, you have this wonderful hinterland that you find so alluring and you're drawn into. And it just makes the music sound even richer and even greater and even more compelling. A great example of that is Frank Sinatra. You know, if you listen to Frank Sinatra, you're not just hearing that amazing voice. You're kind of, I think, also thinking of the Rat Pack and, 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 and the mob and the Kennedys and Marilyn Monroe and, you know, all these amazing things. And, and so many, you know, absolutely uh, pivotal 20th century cultural moments that sort of rest on Sinatra's shoulders and you hear in his music. I get the same thing with the Laurel Canyon scene and particularly Joni Mitchell. This is rich, fiercely intelligent music. Um, you know, I, I would hate to get into an argument with Joni Mitchell because she's just intellectually on a completely different plane to me. She'd make me feel you know, ridiculous. But, you know, good music doesn't need um, to go through the brain. Anyone can enjoy a song like Big Yellow Taxi um, and its message, which was decades ahead of its time. Um, and number three from 1969, uh, Clouds, her uh, second album. So after the Crosby controversy, they decided to rope in Paul Rothschild to produce this album. Rothschild was already very familiar with the West Coast scene. He, he worked with the Doors a lot. Um, and this album has some really, really big songs on it. Chelsea Morning, um, I Don't Know Where I Stand, and of course, Both Sides Now. But they'd all been big songs for other people up to this point, because as I mentioned earlier, Joni was able to sell a few songs very early on in her career because she was that good straight out of the box. Um, I Don't Know Where I Stand was, was covered by Fairport Convention, who I did in a show recently. Um, and Judy Collins had covered uh, and made a hit out of both sides now. But don't be under any illusions. This, people, is the definitive version. It really is. Um, and I don't say this lightly, and it would take me a whole show to tell you what this song means to me. But both sides now, I do think, is one of the greatest songs ever written. And uh, I have thought that for many years. Um, so if you don't know it, please go and check it out. I'm sure you do. Um, 
So, yeah, so Joni's status as a songwriter is almost instant. The impact she had, um, and on this album, you know, lyrically, she's it, the, the subjects are very intimate: love, self-esteem. There's still certainly a kind of hippie idealism in what you're hearing, but it it comes with hints of a musical complexity um, that you're either going to get, you know. Um, right on board with straight away or or you probably not like at all um you know and clearly i'm i'm in the former category um at number two from 1976 um her eighth album hegira um by this point Joni mitchell really starting to get frustrated with rock musicians uh, and rock music she feels it, it lacks subtlety she feels the musicians lack the nuances she wants in her her music um, which is becoming more and more layered and intricate uh, and the the, the her, her rock uh, musician friends themselves recommend that she gets in some proper proper jazz players um, so enter Jaco Pistorius who we talked about on Don uh, Juan's Reckless Daughter uh, and here the bass really does take center stage. You know, it's it's that that, that fretless bass. It's right there in the middle, dominating the music. Um, Coyote, Amelia, Furry sings the blues. These are really really big songs in the Joni Mitchell, Joni Mitchell catalog. But this album is held together by a vague concept of of life on the road. You know, um, it's it's kind of in a sort of a stream of consciousness the imagery of a lot of the imagery is what you'd see from a car as you're kind of or a bus tour bus as you're um uh traveling mile after mile to the next venue uh for the next gig and so the, yeah so the lyrics flow in that kind of stream of consciousness way um and they're set to her kind of folky jazz chords and rhythms and this is probably the most accessible album of her her um jazz period um and it's 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 got a dreaminess and a smoothness to it but you know as, as always it's kind of the unexpected moments in her songs that that stay with you again album very very highly rated and often makes lists of of, of uh some of the best uh singer songwriter albums of all time but there is an album that um you may well be more familiar with uh and even even people who aren't familiar with Joni mitchell often know this one uh so my number one album is um perhaps not that surprisingly from 1971 it's her fourth album blue and this is this is generally regarded as one of the great albums of all time it was number 30 in rolling stone's greatest albums of all time uh, which was the highest by a woman incidentally um after her third album uh, ladies of the canyon she decided to travel around europe um her personal life was at a crossroads she'd been breaking up with graham nash and she was beginning to get together with james taylor um, and so this album is very it's very personal it's very open it's a very honest album some of it's strikingly so uh, most famous for California A Case of You The Last Time I Saw Richard and the absolutely sublime uh, River um, you know the the melodies and this goes for a lot of the best Joni Mitchell stuff the melodies kind of feel like they're playing hide and seek with her unusual chord patterns and guitar tunings and then when you finally do sort of see one or hear one you kind of want to grab it and go there it is there it is and that's her genius you know you have to work hard to get the best out of Joni Mitchell if you're just letting it you know wash over your ears you're not making the most of it I don't think this album is so lyrically explicit and it's so musically layered uh, and subtle and complex that it's so ultimately rewarding if you stay with it and you give it the time that her art and craft deserve well look that's the end of my uh, Joni Mitchell rundown what else is in her back catalogue worth exploring well I'd steer clear of the 80s albums uh, certainly I think I w you know her, her, her legend was really built on those that run of first eight or nine albums which was very prolific and the consistency was incredibly high I'd say actually her best other album is a live album, Miles Viles, which uh, she recorded in the 70s, which is a really, really good uh, record with some great versions of many of her best songs from that period. She did do an album called Both Sides Now uh, later in her career where she revisited some of her own personal uh, songs of other people, but also did a, 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 a sublime version of um, Both Sides Now where she sang it slower, she sang it deeper, and it was amazing to hear how she'd taken this, this song 
and sung it with a completely new perspective. It was it's just so prof profound and very, very heart heartbreaking in many ways. Um, I think a lot of people um, towards the end of Jodie Mitchell's recording career thought that maybe she had lost too much of her innocence and she'd almost started to believe her own press as an artist. Those are other people's words um, because I, I am a mere bug scuttling across the floor um, compared to an artist of her stature uh, and her talent. So don't get angry with me. Uh, I know my place. But look, um, that's it for this week. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed um, my rundown. If you don't agree with me, uh, if you're a Joni, even if you're just a Joni Mitchell fan, tell me. Let's um, let's talk. And uh, I'll see you again soon for another Rock Records review. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.